Now, I don't know if um, you've seen this uh, infographic or not, but it's kind of dominated the internet. Check it out. In uh, 2024, nine of the 10 most populous countries in the world will hold elections. That means that this year, 50% of the global population will go to the polling place. This means that ideas like power, politics, governance, rule, and reign will be big topics of conversation. So I thought this morning we'd start with something light. How about you turn to your neighbor and tell them who you're voting for in November? I'm kidding, I'm kidding, okay, I'm joking, I'm joking. I can see instantly some of you guys like turned beet red, others were ready to start campaigning. <laughs> My wife, I think her eyes were like as wide as they've ever been and I've said some stuff that have made her eyes pretty wide. Um, no, I'm not a psychopath. I don't wanna end Elevate City Church today. So, so let's keep those opinions to ourselves, okay? Um, but as soon as you introduce this idea of politics, things get wildly uncomfortable. If you're new, my name is Joey, and we're in a series of messages talking about what Jesus talked about most, which was the kingdom of God. This series is titled The King and the Kingdom because what Jesus, the King, talked about most was the kingdom of God. Can we say that together? Can we say the kingdom of God? Uh, Throughout scripture, it's got a lot of different names. At times, it is called the kingdom of Christ or just the kingdom or the kingdom of Christ and God or the kingdom of his beloved son. The gospel writer Matthew refers to it as the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven. Now, this creates quite the problem for our modern 21st century ears because when we see or hear the kingdom of heaven, we immediately think this mysterious place in the sky that we will one day go to when we die. And the challenge with that is that Jesus didn't come as much to get us into this mysterious place called heaven as he did come to bring heaven to earth, to bring his kingdom down, to bring his kingdom here. He prays this in the Lord's Prayer, what has been called the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter six, verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the cry of our heart. That's the vision of this series, that we would catch a vision for King, Jesus' kingdom vision where it would be on earth as it is in heaven. And truth be told, I just have massive expectations for this series. I preached way too long of a message last week because I'm so excited about this kingdom of God concept. I just want for you to see it with all of its nuance and all of its brilliance. I'm really hoping that this series radically expands the vision that you have for what it means to be a Jesus follower. Like I hope that it's in this series that some of you, that some of the ideas that you have that are influenced by things like Dante's Inferno or by like Sylvester and Tweety Bird cartoons or South Park, which I know none of y'all have ever watched that before because you're totally holy. But some of your like views of Jesus that are influenced by like those things or just genuinely bad preaching um, would get rearranged in this series and you would see him through the lens of being a king. You would see life through the lens of the kingdom of God. You would start to see that Jesus didn't come primarily to start a new religion that you participate in on Sunday mornings. Jesus came to start a kingdom that you participate in every single day. Jesus came to establish a kingdom, one that is spiritual yet tangible, one that starts small but then takes over everything, one that is eternal yet right here, right now, and that it's breaking through, and one that has a king. The question I opened with today, who are you going to vote for, feels so tense because we know who's in control matters so much. In John 18, a similar conversation with the same amount of tension is taking place. It's a conversation about who's king. It's a conversation about what the king is like and where the kingdom comes from. It's a conversation about politics and power, guilt and truth, authority and insurrection, betrayal and subversion. It's a conversation about false kings and true kings, good kings and bad kings, scared kings, and sacrificial kings. I wonder today, do you know Jesus is king? Do you know Jesus as king? 
Maybe you know him as friend. Maybe you know him as savior. Maybe you know him as your homeboy. But do you know Jesus as king? And more importantly, do you live like Jesus is king? Do you live like he's the Lord of all? The king of the cosmos. The high regal of heaven and earth. The one who has all dominion and all authority and all power and that one day every knee will bow before. And let me ask you this. How do you feel about his reign? What do you think this king is really like? How in step are you with his law? How in favor are you of his politics? What kind of approval rating would you give him in your heart? Do you know Jesus as king? It will be near impossible for you to understand the nature of the kingdom of God without you understanding the God who is king. You know, history is full of kings. From its beginning to end, history is full of kings. I mean, just think about it for a second. You've got King Louis, who is known for building the palace at Versailles and apparently also being a member of an 80s rock band. I mean, that hair is permalicious. You know what I'm saying? Leslie, can we do something with that? You think we get, yeah, probably you said, I can fix that. (laughs) This is a king who ruled through absolute power, expanding the the borders of the French kingdom to a height that's never been rivaled for or since. You've got Henry VIII, Henry VIII, and Henry VIII is known for having six wives and apparently indulging in his fair share of six packs. Henry VIII is known for killing two of his wives because of their inability to produce for him a male heir. We now today know today via modern science that it was actually King Henry's fault, that it's not actually on the woman, but it's on the man. And so he is just angry and drinking and killing his wives. And so modern historians actually call him the king who is fat and furious. That's a good joke, okay? I don't care who you are. That's a good joke. Uh, Moving on from King Henry, we've got uh, Alexander the Great, Alexander the Great, and Alexander the Great is one of the most uh, epic military geniuses of all time. Alexander became the king at the age of 20, and he had an empire by the age of 32. I don't know about you, but that makes me feel fantastic about how I spent my early 20s. (laughs) But he was a king, a brutal, barbaric, warrior king. We've got King Tut. King Tut was the boy king from the Egyptian empire. His grave, his sarcophagus told us more about ancient Egypt than almost any other artifact. It told us about the dominant reign of the Egyptian dynasty, just how barbaric and innovative and progressive they were in terms of military design and brute force and achievement. You've got Genghis Khan, Genghis Khan often translated Great Khan, which translates universal leader. Now, Genghis was king of the Mongolian Empire, and in their conquest, get ready for this, they claimed 40 million lives. Historians estimate that Genghis Khan reduced the global population by 11%. 11%, all in an effort of expanding their territory and uh, expanding their kingdom. And I know that from the photo, this dude isn't much to look at, but this dude was a like serial polygamist. This dude had wives on wives on wives. Uh, It is estimated today, this is wild, that up to 16 million men could uh, could, uh, be genealogical descendants of Genghis Khan. That means that this guy took so many wives and had so many babies that he could be your great, 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 great grandfather. That guy. (laughs) And he was a king of barbaric brute force, not the kind of king you want to catch in a back alley. And then you've got Gaius Julius Caesar Augustus, also known as Octavian. He is known as the architect of the Roman Empire following a bitter civil war with Mark Antony and Cleopatra. Augustus emerged victorious and became the first emperor of Rome. Then he named a month after himself as one of his first moves, was declared a god and had his empire last for a thousand years. Now, 
Think for a second about what all of these kings have in common. Do you know what they all have in common? Every single one of them. They were brutal, barbaric kings who advanced the borders of their territory through war savagery and whose pursuit was absolute, total and complete maniacal control. Every single one of them have that one thing in common. And then you've got Jesus of Nazareth. The Nazarene, the king of the Jews, written in Latin, Greek, and Aramaic. Here's Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Not the king that you'd expect. Not like any king who had come before. I find it so interesting, and I don't know if you've ever considered this, but Jesus is the king with the largest empire the world has ever known, and yet he built that empire unlike any other king. It is so important for you to grasp today the kind of king that Jesus is if you are ever going to rightly participate in the kingdom of God. If you're ever going to understand what this kingdom of God business is really about, then you've got to understand what kind of king Jesus really is. Let's jump into the story. John chapter 18, verse 33. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Now, if you were to flash back three years ago, you would see Jesus burst onto the scene like a bullet out of the gun. He steps into the Jewish landscape with these words, Mark chapter 1, verse 15. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Now, if you were paying attention, if you weren't paying attention, you could have missed it. But if you were to the observant person, it was evident that Jesus came to start a revolution. An irresistible revolution. One that the Jewish people had been waiting for and eagerly longing for. That's why these 12 young Jewish boys are so zealous to drop their nets and to leave their jobs and to leave their family and to follow Rabbi Jesus. You see, contrary to popular belief, signing up for discipleship is not signing up to go to school. It's signing up for a revolution. And these young boys sign up to have their entire worlds reoriented around this man who's claiming to start a kingdom. They will learn his ways. They will understand his methods. And one day they will go on to advance his mission. Jesus, he preaches in synagogues and in the public square and on the side of mountains, crowds gather to hear him. He performs miracles and he heals the sick. He teaches as one who has authority and he goes toe to toe with the religious elite. But then one week before Jesus meets Pilate and in John chapter 18, something happens. It's on Palm Sunday. Do you remember the story? Jesus comes into town and he's riding on a donkey. And this is to fulfill a kingly prophecy from the book of Zechariah. And the crowds, they gather together and they lay down their jackets and their palm branches. And they begin to shout, Hosanna! Hosanna! Now, Hosanna, if you don't know, it means save us, please. Save us, please. Please, here comes this king riding in on a donkey. They lay down their coats and their palm branches, creating a processional for the king. And they shout, Hosanna, you're the king, you're the one. This miracle-working, Torah-wielding Jewish man has come to release them from Roman oppression. And so on, Monday, on Sunday, they shout, Hosanna. And on Monday, they shout, Hosanna. And on Tuesday, they shout, Hosanna. On Wednesday, they shout, Hosanna. On Thursday, they shout, Hosanna. And on Friday, they shout, crucify him crucify him he's not the one we got the wrong guy crowned the wrong king crucify him this is jesus of nazareth and in john 18 he is betrayed john 18 tells a story where he's betrayed by judas kissed on the cheek in a garden in the middle of the night by the time we pick up the story he's already been arrested and tried in total jesus will experience Six different trials, three religious trials, three political trials, three Jewish trials, three Roman trials. By verse 33, he's already been tried multiple times religiously. He's been punched in the face because of the statements that he's made about being king. And they just keep passing Jesus up the totem pole. They just keep passing him up the pecking order. He goes from the former high priest Annas to the current high priest Caiaphas, and now they bring him to Pilate. 
They take Jesus and they throw him at the governor's steps. They won't go inside because if they do, they'll become ceremonially unclean and not able to participate in the Passover. So they take this man, Jesus, who's been punched in the face, has his hands tied together, and they throw him at the steps of the governor's mansion. Already experienced three trials. Pilate walks out the door. He goes, what's this man doing here? What's the situation? And the Jews respond to Pilate. They say, you know that we wouldn't have brought him here unless this was a big deal. And so then Pilate asks, what are the charges that you bring against this man? He says, do you think we'd bring him to you if this wasn't a big deal? He's claiming blasphemy. He's saying something that is totally incorrect. He's claiming to be king. Verse 31, Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law then. But the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Now, this is where you need some Joey McLaughlin nerdy historical context. Pilate, if you want to know his background, went from being a military general to governor of Judea, largely in part due to his friendship with Sejanus. Sejanus was an imperial guard and trusted advisor to the Roman emperor Tiberius. By all accounts, the only reason that Pilate got the job of being governor over Judea is because he was BFFs with Sejanus. Sejanus got him the job. Now, Judea and Palestine have been turbulent, troublesome areas of unrest for millennia. The news lines of today tell us that's still the case. Pilate is the fifth governor in the last 30 years. Not like our governmental system where they're demanded to rotate. You only move on if you don't do well. And so to have five governors in 30 years means that that the turnover rate is extremely high. People can't live up to the bill of governing this land. The first three were very short rules, very short rules. Violence breaks out, people rise up, they try to overthrow the Roman establishment. The power of Rome comes in, they squash the rebellion, the next governor comes in. This happens, it happens, it happens. The guy right before Pilate did decent. He ruled for about 10 years, but then just like the rest was overthrown. And so now Pilate has been in place for for roughly four to five years at this time. Three years ago, though, something interesting happened. Three years ago, Pilate experiences riots in the city of Jerusalem. It's riots over, you guessed it, taxes. During that time, Pilate ordered the Jews who had previously been able to hold their own court in cases of blasphemy, execute people, he takes that power away from them. They had been able to have their own religious system within the system, to set up court, to try people in cases of blasphemy and execute them for that offense. But three years ago, right at the start of Jesus' ministry, Pilate coincidentally takes away that right for those Jews to be able to do that. Now, why is this important? This is important because it's a political calculus on the part of Pilate. He is doing this to keep the control of the sword at the hands of Rome. But this is also important for another reason. This is important because of the sovereign plan of Almighty God. If this doesn't happen three years ago, then when Jesus is accused of blasphemy by the religious establishment, then he dies according to the Mosaic law and he dies via stoning. Now, let me tell you why that's a big problem. In Psalm 22, thousands of years before Jesus was ever born, his great, 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 great grandfather David made this prophecy that Jesus would die via crucifixion. The same thing happens with Jesus in John chapter 5, verse 32, where he, or 12, verse 32, where he predicts that he too would die via crucifixion, the execution method of the Romans, not the Jews. How brilliant is our God? So John 18, 32 says, this was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show you about what kind of death he was going to die. One more nerdy historical note, and then we'll get the party started. Sejanus, the guy who got Pilate the job, he ended up betraying Tiberius in a power play for the empire. He was killed in the process. This means, listen to this, Pilate is ruling over a crazy, difficult to understand, often violent, revolutionary part of the world. His boy has been overthrown and killed by the established religious group that he's currently talking to. Those people hate him because he took their power away. He taxed them too much. This is the air that Pilate is breathing. This is the environment. This is the temperature. As he walks into the room to speak with Jesus. John chapter 18, verse 33. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, 
are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord or did others say it to you about me? This is the most fundamental question of all time. It's the most important question that will ever be asked. Who is this man? Who is he? Who is Jesus? What is he like? Where does he come from? And is he king? Pilate is wondering whether or not Jesus is just another renegade revolutionary or something else. You see, others have called themselves king of the Jews before. They've gathered crowds of Jews and tried to overthrow Roman occupation. But now with Jesus, a group of Jews are handing him over to Pilate to execute him because he's called himself the king of the Jews. Uh, Pilate's confused by all of this. Pilate doesn't understand all of the economics of this Jewish system and why some people can rise up and say, I'm the king of the Jews and stage a rebellion and why other people can't. Why it's okay sometimes and not okay other times. So he's trying to inquire of Jesus. And, and I love this. I love that Jesus says, do you say this of your own accord or did others say it to you about me? And Jesus is going, Pilate, do you, do you really want to know who I am? Have, have you discovered my actual identity or... Are you just listening to the rumors on the street? I love this about Jesus. Jesus is always looking for people who are looking for him. He's always looking for seekers. Always looking for the true uh, person who's inquiring about his identity, who really want to know him. Let me tell you today, friend, if you really want to know him, you can know him. He'll make himself known to you. He'll reach out. He'll remove the veil. He'll answer the questions. He'll step into your situation. If you're really looking, then you can really find. I love that Jesus, in the midst of this high-powered, politically layered, prophecy-fulfilling dialogue, just cares about Pilate. Who is this man, Jesus, who loves people this much? That in the middle of some dramatic political conversation could slow down long enough to look an individual in the eye and go, do you want to know me? Do you really care about having a relationship with me? Because if you do, this can be way more than some trial in the middle of a stage and some political calculus of the world at large. You can meet me right here, right now. The same is true for you. It can be way more than a church service where we just go through the motions. You can meet the king today. Jesus is looking for people who are looking for him. John 18, 35, Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Daniel, come up and do it again. <laughs> Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? You see, Pilate is used to being the one who asks the questions, not being questioned. Uh, he's almost laughing Jesus off here. He's saying, dude, like, I'm, I don't belong in there. I'm not a Jew. This isn't my fight. I'm a Roman. Like, this, this is below me. This has nothing to do with me. This is petty stuff. Like, this is y'all's little sideshow office drum. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Am I a Jew? What are you talking about, Jesus? This is below me. But then he asks Jesus this question that I just found astounding. What have you done? What have you done? And obviously, it's a question of inquisition. He's trying to figure out what Jesus done wrong, where Jesus fallen short, why they're accusing him. But I can't help thinking about being in the mind of Jesus in this moment. Can you? Because if I'm Jesus, Pilate asks me, what, what have you done? I got some stuff to say. Oh, hmm, what have I done, Pilate? Let me tell you. I took a nap, woke up, and called him Storm. Used a couple of fish sticks to feed 5,000 people. Walked on water, healed the blind, took the woman who was caught in adultery and restored her dignity, Taught the Torah with Shemaika. That's right, I said it, Shemaika. Like one who knows the law. I defied the religious establishment. I read people's minds. What have I done? What have I not done? I stopped a funeral procession in the middle of the tracks. I showed up at a wedding and turned water into wine and saved the absolute best for last. Oh yeah, and I walked into a grave where my best friend Lazarus had been dead so long that the King James said, he stinketh. And I walked right out of that grave and I said, Lazarus, get up and come out. That's what I've done. And if I were Jesus, that's what I would say. Praise God, I am not the Lord Jesus Christ. Because <laughs> he took a much more humble approach. John chapter 18, verse 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. 
my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Now, this is the verse that I like, I really want to like get in on. This is the verse that's like our main emphasis for today. Like if you just wanted to really be thinking about a verse all week long in reality, in light of this talk, think about this verse, this idea where Jesus is going, my kingdom is not of this world and my kingdom is not from this world. My kingdom is not of this world and my kingdom is not from this world. Jesus is saying, my kingdom has a different function because my kingdom is from a different dimension. Listen to this. Jesus is standing in a palace and he goes, my kingdom is not like this place because my kingdom doesn't come from this place. My kingdom doesn't function with the same system, same ethics, same values as this world. Now, make no mistake, my kingdom is a part of this place. My kingdom is a part of this world. My kingdom is in this world. It's just not of this world. It did not originate in this world. Jesus wants his kingdom to come to earth. Make no mistake about it. He wants it here as it is in heaven. But what Jesus is saying to Pilate right now is that my kingdom is not a socio-political kingdom. Are there socio-political implications? Absolutely. But Jesus is saying, I'm not doing kingdom like you're doing kingdom. I'm not playing this game the way that you're playing this game. You're playing chess and I'm playing a whole nother level. You're playing checkers and I'm playing a whole nother level of chess. I've got moves you couldn't comprehend. I'm doing things that you do not understand. This intrigues Pilate. John chapter 15, verse 37. Then Pilate said to him, oh, so you, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king, or you, you say rightly that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I've come into the world. To bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? What is truth? Now, when Jesus says all of this, when he says, my kingdom is not of this world, my kingdom is not from this world, I've come to bear witness to the truth. This puts Jesus to a certain degree in a box that Pilate can understand. Uh, it was very common in Roman culture for philosophical orators to spend all day long just talking about ideas, to waste the day away in the Aragopagus, talking about ethereal, epicurean concepts, just blabbering on, contemplating rea reality, staring at their navel. It's like, which way is up? What is blue? And why is the grass green? And what is, is. Now that's a very funny Bill Clinton joke that not a lot of you guys got, but it's okay. And so when, when Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world, Pilate, a hard military general, thinks to himself, I get this guy. Jesus is one of these philosophical, mystic, poet, hippies. Pilate probably doesn't have a lot of patience for somebody like Jesus being a military man, but he understands him. He knows what to do with Jesus now. He's got a box he can put Jesus in. And we love to put Jesus in boxes, don't we? We love to make Jesus fit our little vision for how he should operate. We love to make him fit in our political box and we love to make him vote the way that our candidate would vote and think the way that our candidate would think and spend money the way that our candidate would spend money. We love to get Jesus in this little box where he's nice and safe and neat and cute and put together and he never steps out of line and it's like, this is nice Jesus, this is kind Jesus, this is loving Jesus, he's always like this and he's got a perm. We love to put him in these little boxes where he's safe and where we can understand him and where he doesn't defy our expectations of him and he doesn't step out of line or make us question things or make us go back to the drawing board and ask the questions, do I even know him? Because wait a second, over here you're saying this and then over here you're doing this and then it seems like you're really passionate about grace over here and then all of a sudden all you care about is truth and then all of a sudden you're just like flowing with mercy but then you're passionate about judgment and then you're like, hey, the man who does not work does not eat and the man who does not provide for his family is worse than an unbeliever. And then over here you're like the poor. Blessed are the poor for they will be comforted. Jesus, who are you? Where do you fit? I'm, uh, 
confused. You're an enigma. You don't fit in my boxes. And that's what Jesus is saying in this moment. I am a king, but I'm, I'm a king who's going to rip out of any box you ever try to put me in. I'm not a king who fits nice and neat and pretty and with a bow on it that fits into this world. I'm going to defy all of your comprehension of what a king should be and how a king should operate and what a king actually does. My kingdom is not of this world. If you really want to understand the kingdom, you have to understand the king. If you really want to understand the kingdom, you have to understand the king. You have to understand how the king operates and how the king thinks and what the king does and what the king's value system is and how the king lived. And and he's not like other kings. And Jesus said, if my kingdom was of this world, then my followers would vote the right people into the places of power and authority. You heard him say, he said, if my kingdom was of this world, then they'd pick up the swords and they would fight just like to push back the Jews so that I want to be handed into your control. My followers would pick up the sword and fight, but they don't, except Peter, okay, except Peter. He wasn't very good with the sword, right? Went for the dude's head, got his ear. That's how you know you're bad with the sword. Just so you know, that part of the story, it wasn't like Peter was going for the ear. He was going for the head, okay? That's just how bad he was with the sword because that's not how Jesus' kingdom operates. And so he's like, we don't, we don't do the sword. Peter does. He's a work in progress. Called him Satan a couple months ago. He's really growing, okay? <laughs> that's not how we operate. It's not who we are. This kingdom is from a different world, operates with a different system. Jesus says, I don't operate using Roman methods. I don't operate using Mongolian methods. I don't operate using French methods. And look right at me today. Jesus doesn't operate using American methods. I love this country. God bless the USA. Like, let's get a flag up there, a bald eagle, and some barbecue. (laughs) But Jesus will defy so much of your American sensibilities. He will push you out of your comfort zone. He will make you question the things that you know. He will create tension within you no matter what side of the aisle you found yourself on today. Jesus is a king like no other. And you will not get the kingdom of God using the ways of Pilate. What Jesus is doing in the world isn't the same thing as politicians. He's not doing what politicians are doing in the world. It's not capitalism or communism. He's not running Democrat or Republican. He doesn't have the same agenda, the same platform, the same ideas or ideology for how this world should be and should operate. See, Jesus says, "I'm, I'm the king, but I'm not the king that you'd expect. I'm not a militaristic king. I'm not a militaristic messiah who's going to kick out your political oppressors, the Romans, and reestablish the Mosaic ceremonial law. I'm not that kind of king. I'm not the king you're expecting, but I'm the king you need. I'm the king you need. I'm the king that you're so much more desperate for. I'm the king who deals with something that's deeper than Rome, who's, who's more entrenched than Rome. I'm the king who comes to fight a war, but not the war that you expect. I came to fight a war against Satan and the works of the devil and the power of sin. You see, far more than you need deliverance from the Romans, you need deliverance from yourselves. You need deliverance from the thing that made Rome so bad, which is the disease called sin, which has gone so wrong in the human heart. And Jesus shows up and he says, I'm not here to remove Caesar or to remove Pilate or to remove the emperor. I'm here to remove sin. I'm here to remove Satan. And look right at me today. I'm here to remove you. I'm here to take you off the throne and let you know that I, and the rightful ruler. We, we love in religious theological circles to talk about the way that when Jesus came 2,000 years ago, he defied everyone's ex- expectations of what he would be like. But do you know today the same is true? Jesus will continually defy your expectations of what he's going to be like. And this is the way that it's going to work. You think that Jesus being king means that he's going to come into your situation in the natural and that he's going to make all your dreams come true. He's going to give you your job and your family and your spouse and your income and your health. But that's not what Jesus is here to do. Jesus is here to do something internally, something much deeper, something spiritual, something on your insides. And until he gets there, dare I say he's almost unconcerned with the rest. 
more than he is after anything else. He is after your heart. You want him to come in and triumphantly change your situation. And he's going, I want to talk about your heart. I want to talk about that place called the throne where you make decisions from and you operate as if you are the king and as if you're in charge and as if you call the shots. I want to come there. I'm coming for that. I'm coming for lordship. I'm coming for authority. I'm coming for your heart. Jesus is the king, but he's not the king that we expect. And what's so unexpected about Jesus is that every king before him had conquered through defeat, through defeating their enemies. Well, Jesus is the king who conquers through being defeated. It's through his death, through his defeat, through his suffering, through his execution, through the mockery that he institutes the empire that will never end. So good, Jesus the king, but he doesn't come in on a chariot, he comes in on a donkey. Jesus was crowned, but not with gold, with thorns. He was robed, but not with regal majesty, he was robed with mockery. He wasn't bowed before, he was punched in the face. He reigns from a throne not made by the blood of his enemies, but by the blood of his own cross. He rules, but not by the power of judgment, but through the gift of mercy. Jesus doesn't get a palace, he gets a crucifix. Jesus leads a cross-shaped revolution. The instrument of his defeat becomes the emblem of our flag. Why? Because his crucifixion led to his resurrection, which becomes his coronation. Make no mistake. Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, he will come back as a conquering king. And there will be fire in his eyes and a sword coming out of his mouth. He is coming back as a mighty roaring lion, but first he had to die as a sacrificial lamb. That's the kind of king that we serve. That's our king. Nonviolent, nonconformist, die in order to demonstrate the values of the kingdom kind of king. His kingship is altogether different. His kingdom is invisible and spiritual. His kingdom is advanced by the gospel, not by the government. It moves forward not with fine-sounding arguments, but demonstrations of the Spirit's power. In his kingdom, we don't make demands, we make disciples. His kingdom is not about winning at life, but losing your life for others. One commentator says it like this, and I, I love this. The kingdom of God is not a capstone of the aspirations and power games of this present order. It's a repudiation of them. If the kingdom of God were about external conformity, tribal membership, or winning in the sense that we define it, Jesus could have embraced all of that from the crowds around him in John 6, 15. Or by teaching Peter to be a better swordsman in Matthew 26. The kingdom of God cannot be understood or articulated without seeing that the crucifixion, don't miss this, is not a plot obstacle on a hero's journey. The crucifixion is not a plot obstacle on a hero's journey. The crucifixion is the hero's journey. The way of the cross is in fact the way. The way up is down. The way to life is through death. The way to greatness is sacrifice. This is the kingdom of God. This sort of self-denying sacrificial love was the only way to transform our world into the reign of the living God. Jesus is a walking contradiction, friend. He's the king who reverses the way our world works. His life reversed the way that kingdoms are established. So then Pilate says, again, so you, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I'm king for this purpose. I was born and for this purpose. I've come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who's of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? If I were to ask you today, what is the most important thing in the kingdom of God? If one word came to your mind, what 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 might it be? One idea, you know, for a lot of people who grew up in church in the South, you're gonna say the most important thing in the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is that God saved me from my sins. That was a big deal. Salvation that He saved me from my sins. If you went a little bit further, you might say love. 
seems to be kind of the popular answer today. The most important thing in the kingdom of God, it's got, it's got to be about love. And I'm not here to say that that's not important. It's very important. But at least based upon this interaction, it seems as if what Jesus is saying in this particular instance, that God came into the world to establish his kingdom for this purpose, to testify to the truth, to tell the truth, for people to see truth, for people to know the truth for lies to be dealt with and for truth to be declared because he knows for these people who are occupied by the Romans, who are enslaved by the Romans, who've been enslaved by the Egyptians, whose whole story and lineage is just one of slavery and rejection and decimation, he knows that it's only by the truth that they'll ever be set free. So Jesus goes like the paramount, the fundamental, the most essential issue in the kingdom of God, what it starts, begins and ends with is the truth. It's the truth. Now, for, for, for Pilate, this is a problem because he's got a disdain for the truth. He's essentially mocking this idea of absolute truth when he says to Jesus, what is truth? You see, truth decay was rampant in Pilate's day. There was this erosion of truth, this idea that truth was just determined within the individual. And there was this constant searching for new truths and what's truth and my truth and your truth. And truth decay was rampant in Pilate's day and truth decay is rampant today. Here, right now, with you and me, we, this is the air that we breathe. What is, what is truth? What is truth? What is truth? You can't tell me what's wrong. You can't tell me what's right. You can't tell me what's right for you is what's right for you, and what's wrong for you is what's wrong for you. To each his own. What's truth? I, I, I can do what I want, when I want, with who I want. This is my body. I determine how to use its members. I'm the, I'm the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my ship. I'm the arbiter of truth, the controller of my destiny. I'm the market ter- corner on truth and it exists in one place inside my heart. What I feel is what's true. I let how I feel in any given moment being the governor of all of my decisions. That is the conversation that Jesus wanted to have. He's, he's wanted to talk about truth and how you view truth and how you see truth and if you are actually the arbiter of truth and the king of truth or if Jesus is. Let me tell you the truth. Jesus is the truth. And the truth about Jesus is that he is king. He's the Messiah. He's the rightful heir to the throne of David, the fulfillment of the promise, the king of Israel. He's the king of all the nations. He's the king of the universe. He's the king of the cosmos. Jesus is king. He is sovereign. He answers to no human authority. All things are subject to him. And one day he will judge all things. That is the truth. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you disagree. It doesn't matter if you don't like it. It doesn't matter if that pushes on your American sensibilities. It's true. It's true. And I know that this hierarchical, patriarchal language can make you cringe a little bit and cause you to talk yourself out of allowing Jesus' kingship to run your life. But let's just talk about truth. How's that going for you? How's it going for you calling your own shots? How's it going for you following your own heart? And let me just tell you what this is just a little caveat asterisk, kind of like fine print put in there. I'm almost more worried for you if it's going really well. You know, one of the worst things that could actually happen in your life, one of the greatest lies of the enemy, there's always this line from a Lecrae song where he talks about like, you know, when you're being successful, you've got this veil pulled over your eyes and you almost don't even see your need for God. And then the enemy's just got you right where he wants you. And so then you can coast thinking, oh, you know what, Joey's going pretty well. <laughs> you just wait. Because one day all of us will stand on the chopping block and we will breathe our last breath and then what? All of us one day will have the great dark night of the soul come crashing into our life and then what? And then what? The truth is that Jesus is king and that life is best lived when we, when we live like that's real, when we live like that's true when we let him determine truth, when we follow him as if he's truth, when we believe that true life and true fulfillment and true satisfaction and true marriage and true sex and true money and true relationships and true dreams and true fulfillment is all found in him. When true time management found in him, true conflict resolution found in him, true forgiveness in him, true life, all truth is found in him. Do you treat Jesus like this? Like he's got the market cornered on truth, like he's king of truth, like absolute truth, like what he says goes, like it's the way that things are. It's not suggestions. See, the 
The great problem today, as Tim Keller says, is most people want Jesus as a consultant rather than a king. And he didn't come that way. He didn't come that way. Uh, Jesus is not a good consultant. Like, he's not. He, he would be a really poor consultant. Do you know why? Because consultants love to go, hey, you know, you could, this is the thing about consultant. I got three things. Okay, three things. It's always three things. If you've ever talked to a consultant before, three things. And um, they're going to tell you their three things. And you can take them or leave them. You can make these little minor adjustments or not. And then, okay, cool, I see kind of marginal gains, whatever. And, you know, all right, awesome, I'll pay you a lot more money later on. But you know what Jesus, do you, do you know what the proposition is? Everything or nothing. Everything or nothing. Everything or nothing. I'm your king or I'm nothing at all. And this is the conversation that Jesus wants to have. And as you get to know him and as you read the Bible all throughout the pages of the New Testament, the chief confession, the gospel in three words, is Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Listen to me. Over 700 times in the New Testament, Jesus is Lord, meaning master or meaning karyos or meaning king. Jesus is king. 700 times. Check this out. All throughout the pages of the Bible, if you were to look the number one word used in the Bible, and you would go, and it would be like and, and is, and the, and of, and all these words that just connect and make sentences, but the, the number one most used word in the Bible that is a unique word that brings nuance to a sentence is a Lord. Lord. Do you know what this is about? This is a book about a king. A king. A king king who came on a rescue mission to show you the deceitfulness of sin, to show you that the way that the world works isn't the way that the world should actually work. This is what Jesus is trying to do when he's talking about truth. Listen, I'm a true king who comes in a different way, who is not of this world and who is not from this world, who has a different value system from this world. But this world has told you a bunch of lies and they've pulled a veil over your eyes and they've told you success works like this and money works like this and power works like this and love works like this and fulfillment works like this. But I say, it's a bunch of lies and I'm the truth. And if you'll come to me, if you'll listen to me, if you'll fall into me, then I'll lead you to true life, the best life, the ultimate life. Jesus is the truth. What would it take today for you to actually follow Jesus as king and for you to treat Jesus like he's the, the truth? I'll tell you what it took for me. It took Barabbas. It took Barabbas. John chapter 13, or John chapter 18, verse 38. After he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. Of course, Pilate found no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? He cried out again. Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. I'll never forget when I first heard this story come to life and realized what was really going on in this very interesting story at the end of the crucifixion account of Jesus and Barabbas. We see the story of Jesus going to the cross. And then seemingly out of nowhere, there's this one character who seems to interrupt the narrative. His name is Barabbas. And more than just a robber, the rest of the scriptures tell us that he's a murderer, the leader of an insurrection, a rebel. Many scholars actually believe Barabbas was a member of the Sukari, an ancient terrorist organization known for high-profile assassinations. The Sukari was a renegade group of brutal rebels who incited riots in the city, and Barabbas had staged a coup. He started a riot that led to murder, got him thrown in prison, and now he sits there awaiting his execution. So Barabbas would have been notorious around town. Notorious. He would have been in the tabloids. He'd have, he'd have had his own docu-series. And this, this man, this famous insurrectionist, rebel, murdering thief, part of a terrorist group named the Sukari, is sitting there in prison under the same sentence as Jesus, being held by the same government as Jesus, making the same claim to king as Jesus. Then there's something else that Jesus and Barabbas have in common. Has anybody ever told you? Matthew 27, 16 records it in the original writing. Barabbas was actually this man's last name. 
Do you know what his first name was? Jesus. This man's name is Jesus Barabbas. Church father Orgian records that the scribes start to scrub the name of Jesus out of the copying of scripture throughout history because it felt so defiling to give this man the same name as the high king of heaven. So today it's lost on us, but history undoubtedly records this man's name. His name was Jesus Barabbas. And the plot gets thicker than that. We actually say this man's name wrong. Did you know that? It's not pronounced Barabbas. It's pronounced Bar Abbas, Bar Abbas. In this language, Bar means son of. The same way that like Mick Laughlin, that Mick means son of Laughlin. This Bar, it means son of. Son of Abbas. Now, if you're familiar with the biblical language, you know Abbas means father. God gave us a spirit that we cry out in our hearts, Abba, Father. So there's this man, Jesus, son of the Father, sitting in prison next to Jesus, son of the Father. Pilate thinks in this moment that he holds the destinies of these two men in his hands. He says, I know the tradition that on a holy day, I will release one of the prisoners that are on death row. So Pilate stands on this audacious stage and he presents to them Jesus, the son of the living God and Jesus Barabbas, both claiming to be king of the Jews. One, an insurrectionist, the other, he's healed and cast out demons and restored dignity. He says, who do you want? Who do you want? Pilate's so sure that everyone's gonna choose Jesus. They, they say, hey, we want, we want Barabbas. Give us, give us Barabbas. Barabbas, give us Barabbas. It says that the high priests are stirring it up in the crowd. He's whispering, it's Barabbas, Barabbas. He said, it's Barabbas. Yeah, yeah, that guy who killed people, who's, who incited a riot, who's trying to overthrow everything, who's, who stole stuff from us, give us him. We want Barabbas. <laughs> I always remember being a kid hearing this story and thinking to myself, how stupid is this crowd? Who makes this choice? No one makes, like how sick, how dense, how dull is this crowd? Who chooses Barabbas? Surely, I, I think if I were that, there that day, I'd be like, I'm one for Jesus, please. Like, surely you thought to yourself, like I was, if, if I was in the crowd, I'd choose Jesus. I would, I'd choose Jesus, I would choose justice over violence. Choose the king of life over the king of death. Choose Jesus over Barabbas. But would you? Would I? Did you choose him yesterday? Did you choose Jesus over Barabbas yesterday? Did you choose Jesus over Barabbas last night? Did you choose Jesus over Barabbas last week? Did you choose Jesus over Barabbas when you're, you know, coming to church this morning, you got to fight with your spouse and you choose your pride over intimate relationship? Did you choose Jesus over Barabbas when you lied? Would you, would I choose, really choose Jesus over Barabbas? I don't know because I often don't choose Jesus over Barabbas. I often choose the way of death, the way of this world, as opposed to the way of the king and the way of heaven. See, the thing about the story is that we are him, we're Barabbas, we're the, we're the crowd and we're Barabbas. We're the ones who choose Barabbas over Jesus, but then we are also Barabbas where Jesus chooses us over himself. He goes to trial and Pilate has to render the verdict and locks the keys of Barabbas and Barabbas walks off that stage declared innocent and Jesus is given a cross, a cross that mind you, was prepared for another man, built for another man with the same name, Jesus Barabbas. His literal cross gets passed to Jesus and Barabbas becomes the only physical living individual who can actually say definitively that Jesus died for me. Jesus took my cross, he took my place, he actually did it. 
And I just wonder on a morning like today when we're talking about the king, if you realize that this is who the king is, that this is how the king works, that we serve a king who is willing to be treated like Barabbas so that we could be treated like Jesus, so that we could be treated like royalty. We serve a sacrificial king who chooses us even when we don't choose him, who lays his life down so we can pick ours up, who pays for our guilt so that we can walk away innocent and clean, who dies a sinner's death to get us into the family of God. Why would you not wanna lay down your life to serve this King, Jesus, who gave himself up and was willing to be treated like Barabbas so that you and I could be treated like the high King, Jesus. If this is the King, I say, long live the king.